Before we begin at the Q&A portion, the interview, Mr. Densmore had something he wanted to say, so I will defer to you. Yeah. <laughs> what is this for, Oliver? Wipe our brow. Uh, so, when Oliver was writing the movie you're about to see, I was finishing up a book, um, my first book. I actually have two self-centered memoirs. <laughs> and um, I gave him the galleys as he was working on it, which is before the book was published. And um, he graciously wrote on the back of my book, uh, I'm taking an ep excerpt, uh, John Densmore is a survivor and a seeker. Well, that's why I love this guy. That describes him exactly. Yeah, check it out. That describes him exactly. He is voracious for new ideas. He has, uh, as the Brazilians would say, saudade, which is the longing, always searching. And that's what a true artist does. Saldaji also means soul. Uh, any of his movies are obvious that he had his heart and soul in the making. And so, uh, yeah. Uh, we saw Salvador, and that was it. We were, we were very pleased to have him do the Doors movie. And uh, that's about it. Have I blown up helium up here? <laughs> Hey, that's all I want to say. Well, <laughs> I, I like that opening quite a bit, uh, John, because as Oliver and I were talking about downstairs, I think one of the fascinating things of art... Steve, if you pull it back a little, it won't echo as much. Okay. See, he's a pro. I'm not. <laughs> but, okay, with less echo. What I was going to say is that, you know, one of the really interesting things about revisiting art is to look at how it's changed for the person over the years. So the fact that you wrote a book around the time that the movie was coming out in 1991, and now Oliver's done the final cut of this, I would imagine for both of you that you see very different things in this 28 years later. Is that the case for both of you? Are there things that you go back and kind of surprise you a bit? <laughs> well, I saw the film in uh, Bologna, Italy. It was a uh, 4K restored restoration with better sound, and Dolby Atmos, as they call it. It's, it was a public square in Piazza Maggiore. And seven to eight thousand people were there. And it was quite impressive. I was watching the film for the first time in a long time, and really, you know, it was a dark film. I realized it was darker than I remembered it. It's because, Jim, the way I saw him, the way it was described to me by so many people, was that the, he was a fascinating person, but he was also extremely internal and would go to places that the, no one else would go to, as you know. And of course, compounded by love, drugs, alcohol, reached, wanted to always explore. He never stopped talk about seeker. He was a seeker and he went to the end of his trip. And I think I see it in a positive way. I always saw it that way. I had big fights with several people about it. You know, it was Jerry Hopkins, actually. I don't know if he gave it to me, but the producer gave me, before I started the project, 120, more than 100 transcripts of people who had known Jim Morrison in his life, from grade school to the last moments in Paris. And I met a lot of other people. So it was like, that script was put together from those transcripts, essentially. Um, and I was, you know, I wish I could convey that maybe better now, the, 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 uh, the joy, the creativity of Jim. He really did that American Prayer album, the, the poetic album, is amazing stuff. And people mock his poetry, but I, I think it really is beautifully done. The movie, there's three, three of the American cuts. It's the movie, which you'll hear first, Ghost Song, 
And uh, I'm sure you remember the, sacred, the, the severed garden, as you'll hear at the end. But it's, listen to the poetry. This man is a poet, not just in these poems, but in the songs. The lyrics, uh, some people make fun of them, but I just think that they, they stay the course. They're haunting. They're echoed through this whole movie. The movie was written for the music. It was not written uh, for uh, character. It was following the flow of his life through the, the songs that he wrote and the doors created. And um, people said he went downhill. I don't feel that. You'll see for yourself. Judge the, judge the music. I don't think he went downhill. Maybe his behavior became more erratic. But the creativity was always there. And I believe in my heart that he was starting over. And I think Paris was going to be a turnaround. He was going to be a movie director, an author. He was going to get, he, he grew a beard, he got fat. But it wasn't like he thought negatively at all. There's a wonderful moment when Catherine, Kathleen Quinlan, plays one of his lovers, uh, tells him he, get, he got so fat. Look at, look at his face, uh, Val Kilmer's face, when he responds to it's a very moving, uh, it shows you the sensitivity that Jim had. Anyway, those were some of the things I'm thinking about. I knew I would do some few things differently, yes. <laughs> well, okay. that is so, go ahead. Uh, let me give you a little of that poetry. Do you know the warm progress under the stars? Do we know we exist? Have we forgotten the keys to the kingdom? Have you been born yet, and are you alive? Wow. Let's reinvent the gods, all the myths of the ages. Celebrate symbols from deep elder forests. Do you know we are being led to slaughters by placid admirals, and that fat, slow generals are getting obscene on young blood? Wow. I'm sick of doubt. I'm sick of dour faces staring at me from the TV town. I want roses in my garden, thou dig royal rubies like Oliver Stone. O oh, great creator of being, grant us one more hour to perform our art and perfect our lives. So when I was living this crazy life you're gonna see, uh, and later, when I met um, Joseph Campbell, great mythologist writer, then, then I realized, oh, oh, I wasn't playing rock concerts, I was playing a Dionysian festival, right? Which he captures perfectly at the end. It's just, oh, very powerful. Next. <laughs> no pressure. It is fascinating, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, it's funny, because you say that you realize he captured that. One thing that's always fascinating is I talk about musicians. When you get to see someone else interpret your art, whether it's someone covering your songs or producing your work, you get to see it through a whole new perspective. So as you look at his film and what he captured, did it give you a new perspective? Because again, you're in the midst of living it. You're, it, you're the craziness. You don't get to sit back and think, oh, yeah, this happened last week. This happened the other day. So you're seeing it through a great creator's eyes as well. Well, I see it with a bit of humor. I see it with irony. As an older man now, I realized that there was a lot of me uh, in, in me and that was from Jim, because I was very inspired by him. In fact, I set up my first script uh, in 1969. It was called Break, and it was actually showed up in his apartment when he died. He was reading it, apparently. I heard it was a grapevine, and he was reading it to Pam. And, uh, it was called Break. They found it, and Sherry Siddons wrote it to the office in 1990. Wrote back to me and said, maybe you want this. We just came out in the inventory when Bill went over to Paris. But the point is, uh, I think that, that Bill and, and Sherry Siddons were, were our old managers. Uh, the point was that uh, I was no limits, no laws. That was me. And I think a lot of us were. I would have died probably. Some uh, a lady I saw the other day in Italy reminded me. She said, "You know, you were so great. Uh, <laughs> you would have been dead. Your wife saved you." And she pointed to my poor wife who was here today. And she, she saved you. <laughs> uh, you know, it's true. Sometimes I think Pam, in some way, he loved Pam, and that's you got to realize that this is a very kind of Andy Hardy kind of movie in a way.
story that he has this boy next door, the girl next door, kind of affection for her, love, and it goes through the whole movie. And you wonder why? Why did Jim Morrison get stuck on? You know, that's the, the soul of Jim Morrison. Is uh, he needed that my girl, that girl, my girl, that my girl feeling, and it's a very American feeling. I met his parents, Samuel Morrison, and his mom. I went to San Diego to get their approval because of Bill Graham helped me get through that process. He was an admiral during the Vietnam War. He was the chief of the Pacific Fleet. It was a big job. And Jim did, had very, in my opinion, had very mixed feelings because he didn't want to embarrass his father by who he was. So he never mentioned it. But number two, he must have also he hated that war. Hated the Vietnam War, and I, that's one regret I have. I wish I'd done Unknown Soldier. We shot it, but time, time, and everything crunched. But Unknown Soldier was—he paid a big price for that song. And I'm sure John can tell you they were taken off the air. Radio cut him off. He was being cut off all the time. By the time he hits Miami in '69, which you'll see, it's really tough to be in America for him. Um. I was in this horrendous lawsuit with my bandmates, which I <laughs> invoked um, because they were running off with the name, and uh, you know the, the Doors without Jim, the Police without Sting, the, the Stones without Mick. That doesn't work. So I had to, I had to do this, and I had never met the Admiral. Uh, Jim said that they were dead in his first bio, deceased. <laughs> Talk about cut the umbilical cord, you know. <laughs> At the time, uh, the undeclared war made us hate everyone over 25. Um, but, uh, so, Jim's estate joins me in this loss, and I get to meet the Admiral. Oh, my God. And this elderly man who, who, who drank whiskey and ate steaks at night, but a wonderful guy. And, you know, we were at odds back in the day. We, we wrote uh, uh, Breakfast Where the News is Red, Television Children Fed, Unborn Living, Living Dead, Bullet Strikes the Helmet's Head, It's All Over for the Unknown Soldier. And he was commanding a battleship in the Gulf of Tonkin. Holy shit. And here we are together, and he's here to also support Jim's legacy and not have it fucked with. This a healing of the 60s, right there, was so touching. So that was such a gift. And, sorry, too much echo. We should point out as well, though, very importantly, you got to resolve that lawsuit and, and got to, you know, close out on a, on a positive note, because I think that's something that everyone who is a Doors fan appreciates and feels is very, very special. Yeah, um, in my second self-centered memoir, I, uh, I, which was basically about this legal struggle, the Doors unhinged, uh, Jim, Lake, Jim Morris's legacy was up on trial. I sent Ray and Robbie the last chapter, and the note said, listen guys, I know this book's gonna be a hard pill to swallow. Please read this, because, you know, how could I not love you guys? We created magic in a garage in Venice, you know. And uh, so, uh, we were sort of estranged, um, and then I heard Ray was sick, and I called him, and he picked the phone up. Nobody picks the phone up. And, uh, and we didn't talk about legal struggles, we talked about his medical struggles, and only for five or 10 minutes. And uh, it was my last conversation, and it was a blessing. It was kind of a closure, thank God. So, as I said to you backstage, I love the guy for his music. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. I would say that, I would like to say that Val Kilmer, who couldn't be here tonight, really worked at this very, very hard for me. He auditioned for me many times. Uh, he really, it was a learning process and he worked very closely, as you remember, with Paul Rothschild and also Bruce Bachman, but Paul was the key driver. And trying to, 50% of the film, or maybe 40%, but 
good chunk is, is Val in those close-ups. Oh, yeah. He should get nominated. I don't know. I, I urge you. I, I don't notice a difference when it shifts to the wider shots or tighter shots, but be aware of that. And that's, that's the amazing amount of vocal work that Val did. Of course, it's hard every day. I mean, his throat was always an issue, and we would run out of he'd run out of energy. But, and it was difficult to shoot. I mean, we were, we were at odds, if you remember. But he really did a great job, and uh, I wish you the wish you could enjoy him and be here tonight. But... Um, Val gave me the creeps on the set. He said, he thought that Jim was back. So there you go. Paul Rothschild, you know, you might tell him, he was like the producer. The production, the, the guy who was the line producer, did all the details, right? And, and Paul produced our first two albums. No, whoa, uh-oh, brain strain. Uh, he produced all of them except the last one and uh, kind of taught us how to make records. Wonderful guy, very committed. Yeah. I just want to go back for a second. It's kind of fun that, uh, as Oliver was saying, that break Jim was reading at the time. I liked your response of, wow, it's interesting. You guys now have obviously known each other for several, several, uh, well, the film goes back 28 years, so probably a good 30 years. And it's interesting that you're still learning new things about each other. It's kind of fun to do this conversation. So you, did, were you aware of the break thing, John, or was that just, yeah. When he just said that Jim was reading break. Yeah. So Oliver, important question. Since the, the script was returned in 1990, Will Break ever be made? Huh. No, it became another script. It became part of Platoon, actually. Wow, okay. Uh, it was a very abstract script, and it was, that was a years of abstraction. It was, Jim, as you know, you saw his student films, you may have. Yeah. And he says one line in the film about, we're gonna make a film about the road man, we're gonna call it Zero. <laughs> that was the mentality. He, he was into the easy rider, he was into like changing things, and being Dennis Hopper. He was uh, fascinated by film, no question. So was Manzarek. Uh, Jim uh, would have been, very, at that time, would not have been a commercial director. But who knows what would happen, you know, if he'd survived. And I think there was some bad luck involved, and obviously destiny. But uh, I do feel so he was on the right path. And could have come back for that second act, that second life. Second life, and he's here. Come on, he's not dead. We all know. When you get to the Miami coast, I just get kick out of that every time I see it. Just, you'll, you'll re it feels like the gym's in your skin there. He can, he, that's the way. <laughs> so the, the Roadman is the name of the guy in uh, Native American peyote ceremonies. Um, you know, years, for years I've been asked, well, if Jim had survived, would he be, you know, clean and sober? Would he be uh, a, around? And, and I always would say, nah, nah, he, kamikaze, kamikaze drunk. But I have changed my tune in the last few years. I think about uh, Eric Clapton. Uh, Eminem had an album called Recovery. It's a different time, you know? And he, man, if he had survived, would have been making films with good music. At what point did you come to sort of change your tune that he would have been sober? Was it, I, I mean... Because it's a different time now, and you get a little objectivity, hopefully, as you get older. Uh, backstage earlier, I was telling Oliver, my friend Michael Mead has this line, everybody gets older, but not everybody gets elder. <laughs> Meaning yeah. some wisdom about what you've gone through and hopefully can impart some to the culture and think about future generations and stuff. What was the question? <laughs> uh, we'll change off this. I want to go back to Unknown Soldier for a second. Speaking of, of wisdom. This was fascinating to me. I got to not, uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, interview the great Nile Rogers. Everybody knows Nile Rogers, right? From Sheep, when he's Boeing, all of this. He was telling me a fascinating story about how the Doors changed his life. It was actually the Doors that turned him into a rock fan after he 
went missing for two days and did acid with Timothy Leary. That didn't tell him once. But he was talking about that, and one of the things he said was he was looking at a song like When the Music's Over and the environmental implications of that song and how progressive it was at the time because no one else was talking about that at that point. So for both of you then, it's interesting, Oliver, you mentioned wanting to do more with Unknown Soldier. As we look back, some of, you know, I was gonna say some of those songs, that's not fair. All of those songs still resonate so much and are so as relevant today as they were then. So are there particular songs that you guys would love to incorporate into, let's say if there was a quote unquote, what's the Hollywood term these days, reboot? If there was something like that, or just songs that, that really stand out for you, that when you look at the climate in 2019, that you're like, Come on, yeah. there's so many. I just I have a list here of the songs that we're moving out. I just want to remind you, Riders on the Storm, People Are Strange, Love Street, Indian in Summer, Moonlight Drive, Break On Through, Light My Fire, The Crystal Ship, Wild Child, Back of a Man, When the Music's Over, To Spy, Your Lost Little Girl, Love Me Two Times. Not to touch the earth. Yeah! <laughs> touch the earth. Touch the earth. Soft earth. Roadhouse blues. Five to one. One to five. One to one. It's out of line. End of the night. L.A. woman. Coming down a song. Strange days. We shot it, but you know, don't, you're talking about something they're not going to see. They're going to look at it. I wish I would hit that note, but you know, I was reeling from all the criticism I'd gotten from uh, Vietnam War films, and I was politicizing. So you know, I was very sensitive, and I was wrong. But it's one of those things where you're wrong. I'm also wrong about one of the cuts I made in the final cut. It really doesn't work. So you know, I pay the price. Uh, if, if I regret cutting the last scene because it really does work. Okay. Make it sound like <laughs> Forget the, if you the original, those of you who are old enough to remember the original film, you'll see that I think the original ending is better than that. I think it's okay. <laughs> you know, some people diss this guy as being a, a little bit, uh, how should I say, over the top. It's called passion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so funny too, because you're like, oh, that you regret making this cut. John can speak to this as an artist. I remember years ago getting the interview with Don Henley, and we discussed the fact that, you know, Desperado is one of those songs that everybody loves, considered one of the greatest songs ever written. He's like, I listened to that song, and all I hear is the way that we recorded the drums and the fact that I was 24, and damn, I wish we could re-record it. So I, I think that's, that's the curse of the artist. So I'm sure John will cut you some. Slap on, on the new ending. <laughs> e. e. Cummings said, the way to genius is through, quote, ruthless editing. <laughs> Ooh, that's tough. <laughs> so, how many people, by the way, have seen the film originally? Yeah! Oh. So, so, a very strong percentage. How many people are seeing it for the first time? <laughs> yeah, I've more returnees, but you know, for both of you, for those seeing it for the first time, or for those who are probably seeing it for the first time in maybe decades, you know, what, what would be the coolest thing, you know, what exists now that's so different, of course, is people are gonna go on social media afterwards, and they're gonna tweet about it, talk about it on Instagram, whatever the hell they're gonna do. What would be the coolest thing for both of you to hear about this film tonight? The best compliment that you can get. The train! <laughs> that is great. Just the truth, whatever you feel. If you, you know, you're in a different generation, you feel different. <laughs> Sorry, that one I didn't hear either. <laughs> the truth. That, that, Listen, you know, Rhapsody in Blue, or 
But Bohemian Rhapsody, well, I enjoyed very much, and this is another generation, so, you know, this just moves on, but there's no reason you can't go back and be really into this fucked up shit that we're trying to It's poetry, though. That's the poetry. Please pay attention to the words. It's a movie of poetry. It's about poetry. There was Dead Poet Society, and then there was a Doors. You know, about it. Oh, he, he asked, did you have a good world when you died enough to pay some movie on? Yeah. He, he makes it. It's funny, you mentioned Bohemian Rhapsody. That's an interesting thing. I was thinking about that the other day. I mean, you know, you look at it musically, and John, you and I have talked about this immensely over the years. The Doors were always way ahead of their time musically, and now here you were, thematic, or cinematically, I should say, 30 years ahead of the time. I mean, it's funny. Do you see this as a little bit of a precursor, too? I mean, look, now all of a sudden you got these rock biopics coming out uh, all the time. I don't think so. I think that was all. They've always done musical biographies way back to Cole Porter and way before that, Al Jolson. No, it's, no I, I, I think this is a, a Hollywood tradition. And I'm glad I got a chance to make it because it was very, we were sandwiched because the movie had almost been made at five times. There was so many scripts at one point. I came on and I was at that right juncture. So I grabbed it and I said, yeah, let's do it. And Bill Graham, Mario Casar, they played a gigantic role. Sasha Harari, you remember him? Wonderful, and uh, Nick Klados, the, the lawyer from Bill Graham, made so much. He got Ray Manzarek to sign off. Ray, he got Ray Manzarek and, uh, to sign off, and he got the, the parents of Pamela. We had to get the parents of Pamela to sign off. That was a big deal, and the parents of Jim also. So there was like so many factions. And every rock bio, anybody who knows the stories, is so impossible to make. I spent. A lot of time on the Bob Marley thing, and it just almost happened, but it fell apart because of all the feuding factions. That's the problem in these rock fucking movies. <laughs> oh, I, I remember uh, on the set when we were having a little dispute, I don't know what it was about, and you said, Damn, you know, the trouble with these biopics is if you're making it and some of them are still alive. <laughs> But, you know, maybe, okay, maybe a musical, cold border, 30s or whatever, but the Doors movie, I mean, it's one of the first rock shows, isn't it? I mean, pretty much. That was Woodstock. That was Woodstock, and wasn't there a, the band, the band movie? Yeah, those are documentaries. It's, 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 uh, no, I know it. Uh, come on, Tommy was great. Tommy with Ken Russell. Okay, I love that. you win. <laughs> uh, music lovers, uh, although it was, uh, it was about Tchaikovsky, but it's great. No, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Mahler's story. Right. <laughs> but uh, the thing about Doors is it is more psychedelic, maybe, but although Ken Russell does approach it. Yeah. I mean, people were not doing LSD back in the 19th century. Maybe they were. <laughs> I didn't know what either, sorry. But, it, you know, it's funny, because, well, Tommy, though, was also, I mean, you want to talk psychedelic, the acid theme, but it was not a, a biopic. So I, I do think it's funny, as we list all these films, a, a pick of this size, a, a, you know, a major Hollywood movie, you know, telling the story of a rock musician, actually, it's hard to think of that many that came ahead of time. That's what I think John was getting at. And so so I, I think that, you know, take the credit for, you know, being 30 years ahead of the curve. Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan said that he, he's about three to five years ahead of his audience. Um, and then some artists are a few years ahead, and then some are uh, at six feet under, and they finally get <laughs> recognized. But, um, you know, you're always pressing the envelope, and that's uh, the, the cutting edge is where all the new juice is, right? So, I, 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 I feel that. Of course, I challenge a lot of the uh, a lot of the thinking at the time, so I do get in trouble a lot. <laughs> and, and you backstage, you're telling me about this, a new a JFK document too, and maybe a limited audience. I'm writing another book, maybe a limited audience, but we care about what we're doing, and so so what? It's the path and the size of the audience. You know, if it's giant, great. If not, if you really 
put your heart and soul and blood into it. Well, this picture was too dark. Let's be honest. It didn't make the money that Bohemian Rhapsody made. It opened. It did very well the first couple of weeks. But the under 40s, the under 30s, but it, no business, no business at all over 40. None. And I mean, in the South, forget it. You know what I'm saying? It was not. Morrison was considered foul mouthed and complete animal. We'll see. I mean, this picture is so fucking dark. <laughs> For 1991, even. It was, uh, it was a hard one, too. But a goddamn it, Carolco pictures. Mario Kassar put up all the money, and he, by the way, it's expensive because it was LA, and you can't rent anything in LA. For, for, you can't make any deals. Thank God art is not judged by how many tickets you sell. worked in Japan, it worked all over the world, you know. It may not have had that huge uh, popularity in the U.S., but it worked everywhere in the world pretty good. I mean, even Russia. So uh, I'll see you in another 10, 20 years when we talk about the same movie. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the fact that we're sitting here 28 years later and there's a full audience who's excited to see the film. Give it up for, I mean, come on. How freaking awesome is this? John Gansborn.